tip of iceberg. And we all know digital environment is still growing. Uh, let me give you this, this quotation from the former Google CEO, Eric Schmidt. He said uh, about this iceberg by saying, every two days now, we create as much information as we did from the dawn of civilization up until now. So it's a huge amount of data. Data, data everywhere. In such global network, almost everything recorded by us, by posting through social media tools. Here's the case study. Let's look at the killing, killing bin Laden operation. When the operation has started, locals tweeted that helicopters view uh, was hovering and the low-flying helicopter crashed into a populated area just in a minute on that atmosphere. This is uh, important in a sense that it is easy to find local information and collect data on the ground. Today we call it, and the academia call it, citizen journalism, where individuals play an active in process of collecting, reporting, analyzing, disseminating news and information. I find this quote so interesting and it clarifies how technology can affect diplomacy and international relations. And I will continue on that issue. Um, yes, in a world of Twitter, being able to sneak out of Pakistan and fly to China and do secret negotiations, it is hard. And this one is also important. Diplomacy is still diplomacy, but the theater of diplomacy has expanded because of the multiplicity of stakeholders, the growth of the media, and the rapid communication of information. Traditionally, diplomacy is known with statecraft, and states are the dominant players in diplomacy. 19th and the 20th century diplomacy, state representatives or officials didn't need to interact with individuals or society or publicize their performance or travels. International law underlines the fact that only head of state, head of government, and the minister for, of foreign affairs are considered as representing their states for the purpose of adopting a treaty or expressing their consent uh, of the state. We call it, uh, as international lawyers, magical tree. Those are the imported guys. And this definition indicates the fact that it is about international relations and special representatives. You know, when we look at the definition, there is international relations and the representatives are important. But it is still magical tree has full power. But besides IT revolution that I try to show you the tip of iceberg, has widened this definition at a certain extent. And today there is a new players also, international relations, in the international relations, such as international organizations, NGOs, transnational corporate companies, and individuals. The first one, the IT revolution, creates the channels to influence decision making. As today, data and information do not only shape the economy. As we all know, when a new data or knowledge revealed, the economy has an impact. But not only economy right now, but also the politics and international relations influence with any piece of information. We had witnessed this issue on Geneva conferences on Syria. Every small movement, attack, or any change on the ground, direct or indirectly, affect the negotiations the ongoing, ongoing on negotiations, the process of negotiations. But I'm not going to talk about this issue. Former one is the new players that I'll talk about after the Second World War that we have witnessed the rise, NGOs, transnational companies, and individuals, create various interactions between each other. So now we have moved into a world where diplomacy is everybody's business. 
Uh, although Lord Strang stressed the world war, today, even without a war, diplomacy is everybody's business. Uh, we call it, the academia call it, as citizen journalism, as citizen diplomacy. Citizen diplomacy means people's diplomacy, is political concept of average citizens engaging as representative of country or cause either inadvertently or by design. It is well ta tailored for today, especially in digital environment. Citizen diplomacy is the concept that the individual has the right, even the responsibility, to help shape countries' foreign relations. Citizens can, citizen diplomats can be students, teachers, business people, anywhere. They are motivated by responsibility to engage with the rest of the world in a meaningful, mutual, beneficial dialogue, whether it's a good way or a bad way. After, the new, after we face with the rise of new uh, actors, we will face with the rise of new skills. Uh, formerly, traditionally, uh, British diplomat Harold Nicholson stressed the three important skills for diplomats. And now we are going to change, we are going to see it's changing. Challenging digital environment and mass production of data, which is called big data, and rise of new players, certain effects and force traditional diplomacy to, diplomacy to transform itself. This transformation has twofold, rise of new skills of diplomats and rise of new diplomatic channels, such as virtual embassies. Entrepreneurial diplomats. Netherlands Institute of International Relations uh, has published a report named Integrative Diplomacy in the 21st Century, where they introduce that notion and expand the traditional set of skills for diplomats. And they say, it is now important to create international network and exchange of information and being able to master of new social media is indispensable for diplomats. The diffusion of cell phones across the globe and the shift towards networking, this has produced another radical change for diplomacy. It has been dubbed by a professor of journalism and public diplomacy at the University of Southern California, Philip Sepp, uh, he said real-time diplomacy. Every communication revolution has challenged governments and foreign ministers by constricting their decision frame times. Moving from messengers to telegraph and then phone and now social media. Every means, every advance development uh, creates uh, limits for decision time frames. When we, when we look at the different side of it, for example, the officials and the society, there's a certain level of asymmetry of information. And this asymmetry of information between parties are decreasing right now. But also the decision time frames for officials are decreasing, I will call it air time. This is the uh, tweet of uh, US Embassy in Korea that we have talked before. Uh, they had to interact immediately because the, the threat is imminent, so they just tweeted because it is the most uh, useful way to raise your voice and virtually instantaneous reaction, they call it. I will call it the air time. Air time. As I, as I said, every advance uh, that has reduced the time required for information to travel between two points has put pr pressure on decision uh, time frames for diplomats, whether it, is be, whether it will be steamship, train, telegraph, telephone, radio, television, or internet. It creates a pressure on decision, decision time frames. They have to make a decision quickly. Uh, right now and act. Some interesting information I would like to give you from the Henry Kissinger's new book, World Order. He talked about Congress of Vienna, where diplomats gathered to set new dynamics of new balance of power at that time. Uh, and today, 
Diplomats are in immediate real-time contact with their capitals. And they receive minute detailed instructions. But in case of the Vienna, they were all week away. Uh, let's look at the four days. Four days mean, he explained it, uh, eight days to receive any reply to any request. Uh, which means the diplomats were instructed on the general concept and long-term interests of their countries with respect to the day-to-day -day tactics they were on their own. When we look at the Professor Berich on uh, his book, named British Diplomacy in Turkey, 1583 to present, has a chapter on only specifically dealing with the diplomatic communication between London and Istanbul. He gives interesting details. Uh, in case of the post-telegraphic era, it's uh, pure telegraphic era. I made a mistake, so, so sorry. Um, it approximately takes three months, you know, 1,900 1, miles. Uh, an express messenger takes a mile, five to seven miles an hour. Uh, it takes three, four months to send a message from London to Istanbul. At the end of the uh, 17th century, six weeks or two months has considered it as a good speed. You know, two months is a good speed to just to deliver a message. It is just a funny right now, you know. We just send a message and send it, it just go. And Telegraph dramatically quickened the speed of messaging. Messages that until recently had taken weeks to reach London could now get there in 24 hours. The point I would like to make here is every advanced technology first put pressure on decision frameworks. They need to quickly act. But also, this cable technology creates risk of tapping or interference. Today, it's still concerns of our officials. With the cable technology, speed of communication has enormously increased to the detriment of social security. Now, content is important as much as envelope or case. Um, the last point I would like to talk about, uh, we have talked about the uh, skills, new skills for diplomats. But on the other hand, there is a new opportunities, new channels, which the officials, foreign policy officials, can use it. I call it the computerization of foreign policy operations. Uh, information technology allows states to clarify or push out official lines without the need to organize or host press conferences, as well as to broadcast a wide range of relative minor events or messages. They just, um, and it's, it, it can also prevent escalations of false stories. They need to act quickly and they set a draw, draw a line and uh, um, but on the other hand, I will say it, um, they every official or every state uh, trying to um, uh, initiate new uh, developments to uh, providing services digitally, like the United States call it 21st century statecraft, and the UK foreign policy say digital diplomacy. And IT technologies, information technologies, enables traditional diplomatic services to be delivered faster and more cost eff effectively, and both to the own citizens and government and to those other countries. And e-diplomacy, it creates, we call it e-diplomacy, e and the academia, academia. And the use of internet and the new technology to help carry out diplomatic objectives. Now, we all know, all foreign policy, all foreign office ministers or ambassadors now tweeting, using Twitter channels or social media channels.
for, ans for answering, uh, answering questions. Give you some um, interesting facts, and I will finish it. First official email exchange between the heads of government, publicly known, of course, uh, with the Carl Wild and the Bill Clinton. And there is a virtual embassies. Virtual embassies is a good opportunity for diplomatic representation, representation and negotiations, particularly for small states and developing countries that have limited diplomatic outreach in real world. Um, as I said, ambassadors start tweeting. Uh, the first Mexican ambassador to Washington, Arturo Sarukan, was the first ambassador to tweet personally in his ambassadorial capacity, officially. There is an interesting uh, tweet uh, account at Sweden. Uh, Svenska Institute launched that account. They invented rotation giving an official voice to the citizens of Sweden. Uh, the account is run by different citizen, uh, Swedish, Swedish citizens each week uh, by allowing citizens to raise their voices. Findings. Data, data everywhere. While internet users are increasing globally, we see growing fusion of domestic and international politics. It's uh, intermingled. Instant reactions will be the key to shape, influence, and alter perceptions. Protection of the content of diplomatic communication is significant today. We may all hear the news that some of the foreign ministers consider to use manual typewriters um, for certain activities, to challenge the certain activities. And new skills for diplomats are rising. They had to be um, what can I say, more um, in, in interactive and engage with the society. Thank you so much. Thank you. 
okay, if, if I understand you correctly, the first one about, about Tony Blair. Um, yeah, I mean, it doesn't necessarily come from his own religious uh, background, but that he saw that the struggle for religion is, is important to be sort of it's noticed as one of the things that uh, we need to, to tackle. I mean, it's not only st uh, struggle for the ideology as in the 20th, 20th century, but 21st century is more about, uh, about religion. And well, the interpretation of what's going on in, 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 in the Middle East, in the Middle East, that you know, you have, the important thing is that the understanding religion and to inform the decision making is very important. One of the biggest mistakes that, that the U.S. administration made when they entered Iraq is that probably they wouldn't realize that there was Sunni and Shia and all the things. So they made a big blunder because they don't understand how religion operates in that region. So that's one of my key, uh, my key argument. Yeah, so understanding religion, how it operates, and how it informs your decision making. Uh, if I could give another example, it's like we believe that this, 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 uh, this time of, uh, of year, when Osama bin Laden was captured, his body was thrown right to the sea. Because what the U.S. government wanted is that they don't want him to be becoming a martyr or martyrdom. Because commemoration of martyrdom uh, could perpetuate the cycle of violence. If you allow him to be buried somewhere in the world, people would come and worship him. And this perpetuate the cycle of violence. And Saddam Hussein had the same fate. Uh, although his body was returned to his family and he's buried somewhere in Iraq. The place I talked with my friend from Iraq, it's like quite remote areas that people uh, find it difficult to access. So understanding religion, how it operates, I think that's the core I, I idea of uh, my argument. Because if you understand it, then hopefully the informed decision would be reached. Thank you. It is possible. <laughs> it is. It, I think. I think yeah, it is possible. How people understand other religions, uh, the tolerance and everything, uh, it's very instrumental. But nowadays, when we talk about tolerance, it's not only tolerance on the surface, but understanding that not uh, uh, the, the 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 important value of religion. Teaching that is 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 important. And I don't have anything against higher education that is religious based. Uh, I believe there is now a talk in India to build this university which is older than Oxford University, which is called the Nalanda University, a lot, lot older than, than Oxford. If it happens, then uh, well, it's, it's, a, it's a good thing. I mean, it's, it's, it doesn't mean that there is this uh, fundamentalist Hindu is going to be educated or something. Yeah. So I think it, it, it helps people to understand other religion and it's a wonderful thing if we have diversity, but we harness the diversity for peace building. It's, uh, just to add to this, yeah. just to add to this, it's, uh, I think uh, a lot of the problems that we're getting today in the world, and this is my take on it, it's an opinion, being connected to religion, I think inadvertently points out the fact that there are, there are fundamental misunderstandings. The, the place of education since the beginning of time, I mean, we're talking about Naranda in the 800s, so there have always been, you know, exchange taking place. Before the first wave of higher education development, there have always been exchanges, but more from a collaborative and cultural exchange point of view that has been taking place for you know, 1,000, 1,300 years. So I think the, the place of education in avoiding in uh, in training and contributing to the to religion not being misconstrued and not being taken to extremism obviously have very good ramifications to it. And there is the two have to be working together, certainly, in moving forward. But I think the Shiv Nain Secretariat, if they were to fund some sort of cross bred <laughs> research between Leda and myself, I think we'll come up with a very good solution. <laughs> Noted. <laughs> Thank you. 
and she was seeing me very seven times. Well, you know, you know, the, the three other children, but I thought it was a, it was a, it was a, it was a from the rain mm. blew and mm. it was so it was interesting to hear. Mm. But it was a, a sweet little bit of uh, education. And people from, you know, now come to the, you know, the Western education system. That in those days, the Asian Eastern mm. education system was much more uh, popular, and that was really something that was spread by. Hi, um, I'm interested in the higher education diplomacy in the sense that you talk a lot about, um, in a sense, um, education hub and attracting students to my own country and then sort of um, putting some cultural value or educating them some cultural value in your own country. But I am curious whether you consider attracting the scholar to the university and make the university more internationalized. Is it in another sense that may be a consideration and how do you think about that? I would like to, to ask to August. Uh, I've been working as a journalist and uh, covering foreign foreign affairs, and it's interesting in in my experience how important it was uh, to have Twitter and to have all of, all of these kinds of data and even the junk data, and how we use them to inform and to to tell our stories and to tell to to see how each country or each organization was positioning themselves. But you but to, uh, another aspect I have not thought before, and I would like to, to ask you something informed by, by Held's uh, presentation as well. Because when you put that, the, the negotiators in any conference now are in much closer and immediate contact with their own country. And I would like to ask if you think this may uh, be a problem for the negotiations instead of a, a, a good thing. As you are going to have the two levels of the, negoci the, the negotiation at the same time, 
and so if you think in Putnam's as, as aspect of, of, of the two levels of negotiation, then it may be even impossible to find a solution for any problem if you have to negotiate in the, in the two levels at the same time, while in the pre-telegraph era, the negotiators would go with this information and would reach the agreement they found good. So do you think this may be a problem as well that may be some of the causes, one of the causes of the health problem? Thank you so much. Um, Actually, you raise a very, very good, impo very significant, significant point. Um, when I talk about the Vienna Congress, uh, they, for example, many some of the countries attacked the other, other one, but the uh, diplomats didn't know, and they still negotiating with each other. And you know, there is really weird and interesting examples in the history that uh, messengers sent for peace, but on the road, the, the just war outbreak, you know, the each state start fighting with each other, and uh, the messenger go there, and the message is nonsense. But now, you say, it, there's the instantaneous, instantly messaging. They are really keep in touch, real-time connection. And on that point, we need some new skills. That's why I raised it issue New actors raise for new skills for diplomats. New skills, they need to they need to look strategically, and the uh, the, new, the new actors and the IT communication technologies, and directly affect the decision making processes on the state level. They can contribute that uh, processes and influence that processes, uh, but maybe uh, among us there are diplomats. Diplomats have certain agenda and certain points, national interests, uh, that some points no one can argue or they need to you know, defend some arguments. Uh, keep in touch instantly with the capitals uh, is a good thing, which is when they face a new tactic, a new argument, new strategy from the other side. It's such it's such it's such a game, you know. They uh, did I do something? <laughs> <laughs> it's it's a game. For example, negotiations. They thought, uh, they guess they made a well-educated guess. The other um, state probably will propose this point. And we will can argue these points, keeping keeping in touch with instantly to the capital. Uh, make you make the diplomats shift through through the strategic points without any failure. But it creates how can I can say that it eliminates the uh, personal negotiation skills or traditional diplomat skills and. It makes diplomats only representative, not the diplomats, just a representative at certain point. But uh, there are some geniuses on diplomacy and great minds on diplomacy can influence the negotiations directly on the ground, take initiative, 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 and uh, create a new, ch new channels, new uh, tactics, uh, on the other hand, we, if you make the, make the discussion public, uh, it creates a different story. You know, being publicized uh, makes the whole story different for governments and officials. They cannot step back. They need to find further options, further step to eliminate the previous one uh, and take a step. I guess I let's those things. Thank you. For uh, the first speaker, 
Um, do you think it's, uh, it's about diplomacy that does not accommodate religion? or religion did not make the necessary progress to be part of the diplomatic, relatively modern diplomatic practice. Uh, because there is some claims that even religions are being part of a, a political project in the first place. Uh, otherwise, if you are speaking about spirituality, that might make some difference um, to the whole issue. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Okay, I think that's the, the, the argument of my presentation, is that it has been under-acknowledged, the importance of religion has been under-acknowledged, because people look more at real politic, realism, how did they, uh, they achieve their uh, goals by using power rather than the soft power of religion. Okay. Does it, does it answer the question? Okay, I think because uh, different religion g looks at state and religion differently. In some Muslim state, it's rolled into one, so it's difficult to distinguish between both. But in European countries, the church and state is, is different. And after the Treaty of Westphalia, and if you look at the history of Euro uh, European history, uh, this Europe happens because Christendom failed, sort of, and they they built the. Uh, the, all the uh, nations and states in Europe after Christendom and, base, and separate the power of the church and the power of the state. But in other countries, it's just rolled into one. And probably in, in, in China, Buddhism is a way of life rather than what we call organized religion.